researches in the areas of psycholinguistic, sociolinguistic, pragmatic Sorry. and psychological aspects of second language acquisition and production. And he's done some very valuable work in the area of emotions and multilingualism, being multilingual himself. Um, the book that's probably most relevant to this conference is the Emotions in Multiple Languages book, which has now been out as a second edition in 2013. But his list of publications is very impressive beyond that as well. He's a former president of the European Second Language Association, where he served two terms, and current president of the International Association of Multilingualism. He's also the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism. And I can't help myself, he also has got the black belt in karate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eva. Um, Thank you for coming to um, this uh, plenary. Um, thank you to the organizer, to Laura, for being so wonderful and for uh, accommodating my, my annoying wish to, to present the plenary at a different date. Uh, originally, I was uh, supposed to present on Friday, uh, and then um, I think, yeah, three weeks ago. Um, it, uh, I was told that um, my daughter, who is in her second year doing French and linguistics at University of Oxford, uh, she got a double first last year. Uh -huh. and, and in Oxford, they um, have special ceremonies and awards for people who do really well in their first year. So uh, she has a, a, a ceremony um, on Friday evening. Uh, and so my wife said, oh, that's fine, I will return sooner. And then I, and, and I thought, oh, God, my daughter will never forgive me if, if I miss that. So, so I, I uh, yeah, it was a tough decision. But it was that of a proud dad. So for, forgive me uh, for, for uh, upsetting your, your excellent uh, schedule. <coughs> so thank you to Paco. Yes, to, to, to swap. Uh, <laughs> Places. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Um, before I start on this topic, um, I, I would like to uh, start with um, a, a little anecdote. Um, when I got to London in 2000, no, in 1994, um, I realized that um, the, the, the way British people express uh, emotions is not quite the way that we Belgians uh, express emotions. And, and I was slightly baffled at first um, by how my colleagues expressed emotions in such a subtle way, so stiff upper lip, that I, I, I wasn't quite sure whether I got it. Uh, it included our banker, because we needed to obtain a mortgage, um, buy a house in London. Uh, and we had an appointment at two at Barclays uh, near Russell Square. And um, by the time, you know, we were there at a quarter to two, but then you had to queue for information. And by the time we got to the front of the queue, it was already two. And then they told us, oh, you know, that gentleman is in room 105. So we walked to room 105. And by then it was five past two. And we knock on the door. And the banker opens the door and said, I thought we had an appointment at two. <laughs> And my wife and I were both baffled. We thought, is this humor? Uh, <laughs> is, is this telling us off? Um, it, 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 do, is there any emotional background here? Because he wasn't smiling. It was deadpan humor. Um, or not. Um, so, and we thought, so, so my wife and I looked at each other and decided that, you know, in case of doubt, just ignore. Uh, so so, so we, we just sat down and said that we wanted a mortgage and in fact he, he agreed to giving us a mortgage uh, two days later um, but he expected us to change one thing because we had to um, produce um, a, a draft budget for the coming year so that he could be convinced that we would be able to repay the mortgage and so we made everything up because we had absolutely no idea how much life would cost in London. Um, we had vague inkling about transport being expensive, etc. Um, and then um, we, uh, one crucial item was uh, Christmas expenses. And we, we had rather naively put, I don't know, 70 pounds or something. <laughs> and now that, that was obviously some, so a, a cultural violation. 
because uh, he said, no, I, I can't possibly uh, accept this uh, mortgage application because 70 pounds, that is just ridiculous. <laughs> ne never mind about the thousands of pounds that would go on gas and electricity and phone calls to the home country. But we said, is 70 not enough? So, no, 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 no. So, so what, what, what would you put there? So, well, at least 150. We said, fine, 150 it is. <laughs> then, so he changed that to 150 and we got our mortgage. Um, <laughs> So, so uh, ju just to say that um, it, it's, um, emotions are, are also about uh, cultural values, about, emo uh, about um, things that are hard to grasp, because you may know the language, but you don't necessarily know the, the values and, and what is considered normal uh, in, in a specific uh, context. Um, I was equally baffled by um, sometimes uh, students with different cultural backgrounds uh, whose emotions I realized I had no ability to read or to appreciate. Uh, and I was still teaching in Brussels. Uh, I was teaching French at uni the Flemish University in Brussels. And um, there was a, uh, it, it was a class, uh, I must admit that at the time I enjoyed um, giving them rather naughty French songs at the end of class to teach them some useful vocabulary that they wouldn't be allowed to use in their dissertations, obviously. Um, and um, uh, the, the, the students uh, usually enjoyed it, and so they sang along, and you know, the, hard, the louder you sang, the better it was. And everybody was singing along except one um, Pakistani gentleman, and I can still s visualize him sitting there looking not amused at all. And so I was slightly worried, and I was kind of, you know, using peripheral vision to look how, what he was going to do, and remembering to open the door behind me so that I, I, I would just have to push out and run away in case he got up to to hit me. And then, um, as the class ended, everybody was leaving the class, singing and being very happy, and he was still sitting there, staring straight in front of him. So I thought, right. Usually I can feel when people are happy, but I was unable to say anything. So he got up, and he came to me, and he did, thank, thank you for this wonderful class. And I thought, oh, I'm happy you enjoyed it. And I was taken aback, because I thought, right, you know, it, it could have been in your face. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't know any karate at the time, so I would have been badly prepared uh, for... for yeah, 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 exactly. I, I decided at that time that as a teacher, it is good to know how to defend yourself. Um, okay, before I start uh, talking about emotion, I guess it's important to uh, give you the emotion that we used uh, in this study as a universal functional reaction to an external stimulus event. I would say that that his straight face and his hand coming to me was, was that kind of external stimulus event. Uh, it had physiological, cognitive, phenomenological, behavioral channels. Uh, the fitness enhancing, I guess, in that case, would be me being ready to run out of class and uh, find a hiding place. Uh, environment shaping response to the current situation. Um, okay, the basic emotions. We had uh, a, a brief uh, mention of this uh, this morning. Uh, Ekman's theory about uh, the six. Uh, basic emotions and what uh, triggers them. And the crucial thing also is in a way, what are the antecedents of uh, a particular emotion? Meaning that you can be in that emotional state, um, but in fact only people who know you or who are members of your speech or cultural community know that yes, you are allowed to feel anger if somebody does that to you. And that is obviously quite different in different cultures. Um, and, and hence also uh, things like surprised. Uh, were we supposed to be surprised by the way the banker was dealing with us? Or w was that perfectly not surprising in a British cultural context? Um, thank you. Um, also realize that reading uh, British faces, uh, it, it takes a little while. But now I realize that. Um, <laughs> If, if you are not overly familiar with interpreting uh, emotion on British faces, just look at, at the eyebrows. <laughs> if, if, if you notice that either left or right, I mean, for laterality, it doesn't matter. It could be <laughs> left or right. 
if it goes up slightly, that means that you have really upset that person and that that person is ready to knock you to the ground next. So be very careful. If you see that eyebrow go up, take one step back that, and, and bring up your arms in guard position. Um, okay. Uh, is this working? Uh, it doesn't seem to... Mm. Uh, I think it's the, the cook is probably boycotting this session because he wasn't happy <laughs> with, with, with us insisting on, on leaving and, and without dessert. He had prepared the nicest cake and we haven't even tried. Um, aha, okay. Um, so, um, there is this debate uh, between psychologists on whether um, emotions are you know, universal or whether they are uh, culturally specific. Um, and uh, among the people who defend the cultural specificity uh, is uh, Batia Mesquita, who's a, a Dutch professor uh, who works in Belgium and who's an absolutely uh, lovely lady, and she's been looking at this. And um, she uh, underlines the fact that people in different uh, cultures have different emotional experiences, uh, which is a non-trivial fact and that it tends to be overlooked by people who have this more universalist view uh, of uh, emotions. And they have been looking at how people's emotions acculturate. And so they have been looking at uh, immigrant populations in different countries uh, and how they uh, start um, fitting with the local emotional patterns. Uh, meaning that the things that make the locals angry, bit by bit, they start copying that and feeling the emotions that the locals would feel in a particular situation. So this is really uh, interesting uh, research. And one of the uh, studies that they did uh, with uh, Kitayama also uh, was on this um, uh, difference between East and West. And I, I know that earlier on uh, there's been warning words about culture and how dangerous it is to generalize. And I totally agree that we need to be careful Yet, it is interesting sometimes to generalize a little bit and, and, and see what comes out of it. And this seems to be replicated uh, quite uh, often uh, in the United States, the focus on autonomy. Uh, in uh, Japan, the focus on relatedness. Uh, and this obviously uh, leads to different um, emotional patterns in that um, the uh, Americans will uh, report more socially disengaged uh, emotions uh, when they are asked to report something that made them happy or angry or surprised in the past week. That's how the experiment goes. So tell us uh, something that happened to you in the past week that made you angry or sad. And then they repeat that uh, in, in different cultures and then they look at how people, what it is that people report. So in the States, uh, for negative emotions, people would report anger, irritation, ill feelings, uh, where, uh, but they would also, uh, for positive emotions, it would be pride, strength, uh, euphoria, um, and the focus would be on the individual. Um, whereas uh, in uh, Japan, um, the most uh, frequently reported negative emotions would be shame, guilt, indebtedness, positive emotions would be closeness, respect, uh, helpfulness. Um, so uh, the, the Americans emphasize autonomy, where, whereas the Japanese um, emphasize relatedness. So an American would be typically more angry about his individual rights being violated, or at least that person's perception of violation of autonomy, where, whereas in Japan, uh, it, it would be much more uh, a violation of uh, re respect for the community. And this is quite interesting because through my karate, I learn about Japanese values. And it is really that, that uh, in, in the dojo, nobody is allowed to stand out. That humility is crucial. That, in fact, if you are fighting uh, with uh, uh, an opponent, that opponent is your friend. You, are not, you don't want to win, necessarily. You don't want to prove that you are better. It is a, a, a collaboration between two equals. And, and that is an interesting Japanese um, cultural uh, value. Now, how we communicate emotions um, depends on uh, the ability to infer 
the emotions that your interlocutor is uh, experiencing. Um, you are typically not supposed to say what you are feeling. Uh, you, you can't verbalize uh, your emotional state in certain contexts. So you use indirect uh, cues to reveal your emotional state. So um, I guess that if, uh, sorry for, for being a bit stereotypical, but I'm always surprised when I'm in the United States. Um, how are you? Uh, everybody always seems to have to declare that they are awesome, right? <laughs> um, if, so I would say that in that context, anything less than awesome means that it, it's really bad. So if an American asks you, how are you? And you say, I'm fine, in a, in a typically British way, they probably think that you are totally depressed and they will <laughs> give you the address of their psychiatrist. Um, okay, so we all have some degree of emotion recognition uh, ability. How do we recognize it? And well, we have specialists, uh, you are specialists. Um, you listen to uh, pitch, rhythm, timbre, speaking rate, intensity, uh, volume. You, you also obviously listen to the words that are uh, being used and the, the, the content of, of language. Um, and you also observe your uh, interlocutor. So you look at uh, the face, the body language, uh, and, and you try to work out whether the three channels match. Uh, do you get the, the same impression by watching them, listening to what they say, and how they are saying it. Um, so there is quite a lot of uh, research on facial uh, recognition um, that we, we learn a lot from the face of our uh, interlocutor. And then there is this debate that I mentioned before, uh, is uh, b facial recognition uh, universal? It seems that there is an in-group advantage, meaning that it's easier for you to guess the emotional state of somebody who belongs to your group, cultural group or linguistic group or even subgroup, uh, I guess. Um, and I think that I believe that there is value through to the two arguments, namely that there is probably some degree of universal, uh, universality, but also some cultural uh, specificity. Um, also, um, it's not always hard to interpret or, or detect the emotional state of a person if you don't know that person. If you know the person, then you know straight away whether that person is acting as usual or whether that person is, you know, above or below the, their usual um, uh, emotional state. Uh, and as uh, Irvin said, a single tear from speaker A could mean as much as noisy weeping from speaker B. Now, you may think all that is very nice, but isn't that just an academic argument? And the answer is no. And that's, in fact, the reason why I became interested in emotion, namely that it goes far beyond the ivory academic tower. Uh, this has consequences at, at many levels. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, the service industry. If you're uh, working at a reception or at an airport desk or you, you deal with customers who may be in different emotional states, it helps if you can feel or guess or recognize what state they are in. Are they very sad? Are they very angry? It, it means that you have to implement different scenarios in order to create an appropriate response. And um, so the, the, this study by Toms and et alia, they, they discovered that it is harder to guess the emotional state of people who come from a very different culture uh, from yours. And, and in a way that reflects my anecdotal uh, evidence about my Pakistani uh, student. And of course I realized that that one Pakistani student, I shouldn't generalize, it's just an anecdote. But it is, I would say, a, a nice illustration of the kind of question that you, you, you can um, answer or ask. Uh, the other thing is that Emotion words in different languages have slightly different meanings, uh, have slightly different connotations, and hence that where you use a, a dictionary it might not really be helpful uh, if you see a translation equivalent. You have in fact no idea just how much overlap, uh, how much conceptual and semantic overlap there is between the original word and the translation, uh, and that can cause problems in uh, interpreting uh, verbal words, especially if you're not familiar with uh, the, the concept. And um, I use 
um, as an illustration of this, a, a very simple uh, word that is not even an emotion word to non-Brits, um, which is horse. Can you think of horse as a concept? Would you say that's an emotional concept? No. Well, I would say, I'm, I'm looking at our British friend here, I don't know about the Scots specifically, but, but to a British person, a horse is an animal that you love so much. The, the, the Queen has many of them. So what would they not allow in the UK is eat horse, right? Whereas on continental Europe, we don't seem to have any trouble eating horse meat. Uh, in, in, if you mention that in the UK, they look at you as if you were a cannibal, right? <laughs> uh, so you, you think you know the, what the word means, but in fact you have no idea about the, the emotion concept. And I would say that to a Brit, the word horse is in fact an emotion word. Um, so uh, there are cultural effects. Uh, Ju, who looked at the Chinese and Dutch participants, and she discovered that the, the, the Dutch were better at recognizing positive emotions expressed by Dutch people, uh, and the Chinese were better at recognizing fellow, the, the emotions of fellow uh, Chinese, and that some vocal, specifically prosodic cues to negative emotions such as anger and, and sadness, that both groups recognized them uh, equally well. Then it seems that according to your cultural background, you also pay more or less attention to vocal processing, uh, so the Japanese participants in that study uh, look, uh, listened more to uh, the voice, uh, whereas the Dutch were looking more at uh, the faces in order to decide what emotion the, the person uh, was feeling. And hence, uh, this varies um, in different cultures, and I'm particularly interested then also how um, bilinguals or biculturals, whether there is a shift in what they pay attention to. And I have a number of PhD students who work on this phenomenon of emotional uh, acculturation. Um, I would say one of the pioneers in this area is uh, Ellen Rintel, an American professor. Um, and she uh, had recordings made by actors of uh, different ba um, emotion, uh, primary and secondary emotions. She played them to her ESL learners who did a summer course in the States and asked them to um, identify the emotion being portrayed. And then she had a, a control group of American students who did the same thing. And uh, what she found was that there was no age or gender effect, that unsurprisingly uh, the locals were better at recognizing the emotions than the, the foreign language learners, uh, but then uh, also that there was a proficiency effect. Uh, the, the foreign language learners with higher levels of proficiency were better at recognizing the emotion. Um, and then at similar levels of proficiency, there seemed to be a cultural uh, effect, namely that the Spaniards did better than the Arabs, and the Arabs did better than the Chinese. So the more remote you were culturally, the harder it was to guess the emotion uh, of uh, the actor. In fact, I met uh, Ellen Rintel at a conference uh, uh, a couple of years ago, and I asked her, you know, how did you come up with that design? That's such a, an interesting pioneering study. Nothing had been published on this before. And she said, ha, ah, I happened to share my office with a psychologist. And we got talking, and when we were both interested in, in emotion, and we decided to put something together. And, and I like that because that it's exactly what you are trying to replicate here uh, in Madrid with um, setting up this interdisciplinary uh, group. And I think that interdisciplin interdisciplinarity is really the key to progressing in that field. That, that we, we need to um, bring our methods together. We need to talk to each other in order to come up with or original inter interesting uh, questions. Um, this study then by Dromi and his colleagues uh, discovered that native speakers uh, are not necessarily better at uh, recognizing emotions when uh, uh, observing them in that language and that uh, in fact people with more languages seem to have uh, an advantage. And that's obviously something I like because as uh, b being involved in multilingualism research I like to show bilingual or multilingual advantages. Then how do we React, go ahead. Go ahead. Did they do any controls to determine whether that was a cause or just a correlation? Like, I mean, is it that people who like to learn more languages are more impacted? 
Yeah, the, uh, uh, I found that and I totally agree. However, I don't remember and I would have to have a glass of beer sitting with you at the table <laughs> to answer that question. So, so uh, yeah, Let's, we, we'll come back to that. Um, so it, it, the early work seemed to uh, suggest that people are paying more attention to the vocal rather than the verbal cues. So um, how does your voice sound is more important than what exactly it is that you are saying. Collignon and colleagues um, who found that people relied more on visual cues, um, but that they focused more on the vocal channel if the quality of the visual stimuli was diminished. So there is a kind of an order of preference, uh, and if, if you, you can't get enough on one channel, you switch uh, to uh, another one. So um, with, uh, I, I thought this was uh, really interesting, and then I had this MA student, uh, a fellow Belgian, uh, Pernel Lorette, uh, who came to Bergbeck to do, uh, as a visiting MA student. And, um, we, we, we started working together and uh, the, the uh, material I'm going to present to you is in fact um, uh, c coming from her MA dissertation and the work we did uh, afterwards. So we were wondering whether um, first and foreign language users of English would be equally able to recognize emotions shown to them uh, in video clips uh, recorded of uh, an L1 British English speaker whether there would be an effect of proficiency, whether there would be an effect of uh, culture. Thank you to all of those of you who have forwarded this call for participation to your students, to your friends. Uh, it's yeah. great when you do this because that's really the only way to, to get sufficient data. And we were uh, quite lucky here, 920 participants. We always have more females than males uh, uh, participating in those um, questionnaires. We had a nice uh, group of first and foreign language users of English. Um, we, had, uh, we recorded six uh, stimuli, and I will show one to you, though I hope it will work, because I want to show, I should have done that before, in fact, uh, it's a YouTube clip, um, where we asked the actress to improvise uh, six uh, emotions that uh, re represented um, uh, daily life situations, and um, do you think I could click on this or not? I need to have, let me see. Can, do you think this would work? Or do I need to? Can I just? Presentation mode? What is presentation mode? Uh, the way you had it before. Just, uh, do you know how to do this? Because when, when you show data um, and analysis, it's always good to show the original uh, stimulus because everything depends on the original stimulus. Uh, ah. ah, okay. That's right. Perfect. Yes. That, there is a second clip, but do we have found? Yes. Good. So this is like a really beautiful restaurant. It's just really, really nice. And um, I just, you know, kind of, oh my God. Really? Yes. <laughs> okay. So what, what emotion do you think we asked her to portray there? Surprise. 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 Good. Yes. It, it, it sounded like a, a marriage proposal, right? We, we, we don't know whether the, the imaginary interlocutor went down on his knee. Probably. Yeah. How do I get back to... My talk. Be yeah, because I, I have another yeah. one, this yeah. one. Yeah, let me copy that. Go back to.
Uh, no, how do I how do I copy this? Ah. No. Ah, I need to put it in there. Yes, that's it. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. So this is like a really beautiful restaurant. It's just really, really nope, nice. We've and seen that um, one. I just that one. How do I get? Uh, where am I? The second one. <laughs> there is something a bit weird there. Control. Control. Yeah. And for how do I go from there? Uh, maybe it's in the navigator, but I don't know. Uh, yesterday, I yep. went to see my mother-in-law. Um, it was actually her birthday the day before yesterday, but I couldn't go because I had a business meeting. And I bought her a very nice bunch of flowers. Um, very nice. And when I got there, uh, she said, what's this about? And I said, well, it's your birthday, Maria. Happy birthday. And she said, it's not my birthday, it was my birthday yesterday. So anyway, I really hope she liked the flowers. <laughs> <laughs> that, so that was a very British way of showing what emotion? <laughs> Anger. Anger, yeah. So, so these were emotions that were pretty well uh, recognized. There were others that, were slightly, uh, that had slightly lower levels. Um, but the, the, the thing is that, in fact, all... all participants recognized these emotions um, above chance, so, so they, 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 they did pretty well. Um, so we had our participants, they had to fill out uh, online uh, Lextail test, 60 item uh, lexical test, um, and uh, it, it's a test where you have to distinguish real British words or real English words from English-looking words that aren't really uh, English words. Um, and so uh, our native speakers had a 95% uh, accuracy rate. Our uh, foreign language users, 83%. We, I forwarded the call to as many people as possible, asked them what emotion is portrayed, so they had a forced choice. Um, and the emotion recognition score was the sum of the correct uh, correctly identified emotions, and as you see, disgust, fear, surprise, happiness, sadness. Uh, anger, in fact, was only 51% uh, correct. Um, the data weren't normally distributed, so we used um, uh, non-parametric stats, and this was the first surprise. There was no difference between the native and the foreign language users of English. We, we, we were and that's a nice thing about research, really. And I'm appealing to those of you who are uh, students. There is nothing that gives you more, um, I would say, healthy surprise than an unexpected result. When you have every reason to think that you will find something, you don't find something, or you do something, that's great. I mean, it's not great in the first half hour. Um, <laughs> it, it, it becomes gradually better as days pass by and, and you, 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 you try and come up with a good explanation. Um, we did find the expected uh, positive correlation between uh, proficiency uh, for the foreign language speakers and uh, uh, ERA. Uh, we also found unexpectedly uh, a positive correlation between proficiency and ERA for the native speakers of English, which we thought was interesting and unexpected and opened up, in fact, new uh, research uh, windows. Um, we found uh, an effect of cultural group in that the Asians seem to perform worse on that era uh, test compared to all other groups, which was again what we had kind of uh, expected. So um, we wondered whether maybe the number of spoken languages had a stronger effect than being native or, or foreign language user. Um, but then, in fact, there was, uh, we, we checked, and for our foreign language users, they had an average of 3.6 languages versus 2.9 for the L1 users, but there was no relationship between numbers of languages known 
and uh, era. So unfortunately, multilingualism didn't seem to help much uh, at that point. Um, we realized that the crucial difference with um, Hélène Rintel's work was that our participants were typically no longer learners of English. They were often long-time foreign language users of English, which is not exactly the same. So they had probably been socialized, had sufficient, I would say, effective socialization into English uh, in order to recognize uh, the emotions uh, accurately. Um, and then we wondered, okay, maybe was it too easy uh, to guess the emotions in our stimuli? But then we said, okay, but people didn't have 100%, so there wasn't a ceiling effect, so it was probably hard enough. Um, then this correlation between proficiency and uh, era, uh, we were wondering whether the foreign language users were able to stretch themselves because they didn't just have the verbal channel. They could watch the face, they could listen to the voice, and that could help them um, decide what the emotion uh, was. Uh, and, and we also um, checked for uh, our Asian participants, could it be that they had a lower proficiency? But then it turned out that they had a non-significantly different proficiency level, so that wasn't the explanation of uh, the difference. Then, in a follow-up paper, uh, we looked at the effect of early bilingualism um, on ERA. And um, as you see, those uh, who um, did not grow up with two languages, it's the no category to the left, there was no difference uh, for, uh, between L1 users and LX users. Whereas those who had grown up with two or more languages from birth, as you see, the foreign language users of English were better at recognizing emotions. So, uh, yes, were better at recognizing them than the natives ones. So, so that was kind of what we had hoped to find because I think that if you grow up with two languages in the family, it means that you grow aware to not just the language, but obviously also the facial expressions, the way um, dad or mom or, or dad one and dad two or mom one and mom two uh, express their emotions, right? Um, there was also an interaction between uh, early bilingualism, nativeness, in that you see that the, the Alex users um, who uh, grew up with um, uh, two languages scored higher, uh, and the L1 users who grew up with two languages scored lower. And in fact, we have no idea why that lower score. So um, that's what uh, I said. So it wasn't clear what the cause of the uh, disadvantage or, uh, was for the L1 users. Then we repeated the experiment with just the audio signal, because I don't know whether you have ever had to um, phone in a foreign language. Do, how, how draining that is. Because your interlocutor doesn't see your face, doesn't see your eyes going wide, and, and, and you know, you, 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 your silent wish, uh, you, your silent plea for help, or your silent SOS, right? Um, and and I, I remember the... Uh, frustration I felt because um, Spanish is my fourth language and uh, so I did uh, Cursos de Verano uh, in, 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 in Malaga and it was, it was brilliant and I, I, w I went to different uh, places in Spain, made good friends uh, in, in Madrid and then I would um, uh, decide to call my Spanish friend from home and I would rehearse um, you know, the sentences I would use to make sure that the accent was as correct and fluent and everything would be absolutely perfect. And I, I would call her uh, department and it was the secretary of the department who was a very harsh woman, uh, I must say. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, after having, re I, and I usually never repeat anything, but there I would repeat the whole conversation in my head and then say it out and then call her. And then I would say, ah, quiero hablar con Pilar Salamanca. And then I would, and then I would hear uh, her transfer the call and say, Pilar, there is a foreigner wanting to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, it didn't work. So, so my, my anxiety levels went up every time I picked up the phone to say something in Spanish. Um, so, we, we rep so that's why we thought, okay, let's have our an another group of participants just listen to these clips 
and tell us what emotion is it. And there we did find the expected difference in that the, the uh, L1 users were better uh, at recognizing correctly compared to the uh, foreign language users. And we also found the, the same um, uh, correla positive correlation between proficiency and ERA, both in the foreign language group and the first language group. And then uh, we found, again, the same effect, that our Asian participants were, again, um, having more difficulty in guessing the emotion uh, right. But they also had lower levels of proficiency in, in that experiment. Um, then we decided that there are probably, probably other um, independent variables that could have an effect. And um, you, you, you know we have discussed emotional intelligence and yeah. uh, one of my friends is professor of psychology at UCL, uh, Dino Petrides. And so with him we designed an experiment where we also measured um, proficiency, cultural background, but also uh, linguistic proficiency and emotional intelligence. And so we had 301 participants, uh, half of them British, half American. Uh, we had a majority of monolinguals. We had them fill out the lex tail, and we noticed, in fact, that the average was uh, <laughs> slightly lower than in the previous experiment. We didn't find a difference between Brits and Americans, which surprised us because we imagined that the British participants would have an in-group advantage. Um, they watched the video clips that I showed you before. And I have to tell you that this wasn't my usual um, um, snowball sampling. Uh, we did this with the help of Euronews, uh, who uh, appointed a, a, a panel uh, who, who looked for a company that had um, representative panels of different cultures. And so we said, we want 150 Brits, we want 150 Americans. And so they did that. So those are people who do this for money. It's a job. Um, and and so, uh, since we don't have these funds, but Euronews has lots of money, uh, so, so they could pay for them. So it also means that they were not self-selected which is the kind of a problem we have in our discipline. If you ask people, can you do something, you know, only the ones who are typically good at it will want to do it. So here, these were people who weren't necessarily good at it. So that was a, a useful, different kind of population. Uh, we had them fill out a trait emotion intelligence questionnaire, uh, group them in three groups, depending on what their score was. Um, and I would say, uh, not entirely surprising, but the Americans scored significantly higher on emotional intelligence than the 150 uh, Brits. I, I wouldn't make any generalization, but that was kind of uh, interesting. Um, so we wondered again, how, do, how well do they do in recognizing emotions? Would there be differences between the Brits and the Americans? What about linguistic proficiency, trait emotional intelligence? Um, say something more about trait emotional intelligence, a distinction between ability and trait, uh, trait being the constellation of emotional perceptions located at lower levels of personality hierarchies. It concerns your uh, ability to perceive your own emotions and perceive the emotions of the people you are interacting with. So it's a very useful personality trait for language teachers or teachers in general. Uh, those are some of the facets uh, of uh, emotional intelligence. Uh, I underline happiness and optimism. I think those are crucial skills if you are a teacher, right? You have to believe that, yes, it won't remain that bad. Things will become better at some point. Yes, I think it's also a crucial skill if you're a researcher that, you know, at some point you will become better at this. So don't worry if you get a paper rejected or an assignment full of red, you know, um, don't, don't uh, take it too personally. So control your well-being, your self-control, your emotionality, your sociability. Uh, and then we ran a three-way ANOVA, and we found a significant effect for proficiency, uh, trait emotion intelligence, no effect for country of uh, origin, and an interaction. And I will show you uh, the, the, the graph, where, as you see, people uh, with uh, low levels of um, uh, linguistic proficiency, their trait emotional intelligence seemed to make a huge difference. If you scored low, and these were native speakers, if you score low on the linguistic proficiency, then your emotional intelligence helps you overcome that deficit. 
And, and, and it makes a huge difference whether you are low in linguistic proficiency, but you are high in emotional intelligence. You seem to be able to compensate for it. If you're in the medium group of linguistic proficiency, well, there still is a bit of a difference, but not that much anymore. If you are highly linguistic proficient, then you don't need your trait, intelligence, uh, trait emotional intelligence. It doesn't make a difference anymore. So, so I thought, ah, okay, that's interesting because, um, yeah, I think it's probably applicable in different contexts also. Um, so we found this significant effect for the low proficiency group, uh, not for the medium and high group. And, um, and we were so surprised not to find this difference between the Brits and the Americans. Um, and then we started to wonder whether the psychological uh, advantage that the Americans had was maybe cancelled out by the cultural advantage that the British had. And that if in the end there was no difference, it's because they both had one advantage that cancelled each other out. So that, that's the, kind, the, the explanation uh, we came up with. Um, so uh, we, we, we think that having uh, high linguistic proficiency probably means that you are better able to interpret the, the, the subtle emotional connotations of the words that you hear uh, in the clips. So in fact, we want to repeat this experiment with foreign language users uh, of uh, English. Um, and we, the, the, Dino Petrides told us, well, I'm not surprised, high trait emotional intelligence uh, children and adults uh, are better at recognizing emotions and, um, th than their low trait uh, emotional intelligence peers. Yes? I was wondering if you considered television. So, television but, um, uh, do British people see more American. Oh, no. Do, do uh, people see a lot of British television in this case? Right. Um, we, we didn't control for that, but that would yeah. be a legitimate question. Yeah. Uh -huh. who are older understand Slovak very well because they have it in their television. The young people don't have it anymore and no longer can understand it. I mean, right. it's, it's not emotion specific. Yeah, yeah. But, but that's another interesting example of a possible independent variable that you, you, you typically think about possible explanations once it's too late and you have collected the data. But then that, that's something for your next research design. But I mean, that's the optimist in me, right? You, you cannot answer all questions at the same time. So th th that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we think that that's what I said, that lower levels of linguistic proficiency, you rely more heavily on trait emotional intelligence. Um, and apparently similar things for academic achievement. High uh, trait emotional intelligence uh, is a significant promoter of academic performance, specifically for people with lower IQ. Um, so you, 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 you can feel your way out of it, I would say. What are the implications for applied linguists? Uh, and I think that, that they are pretty important. It's that I'm often surprised at how little attention is given to uh, emotions and how emotions are uh, expressed, uh, portrayed, uh, in uh, um, language course books, uh, how, much, how, we, how language teachers probably spend too much time on grammar and not enough on emotions. So I would plead for, for more focus uh, on uh, emotions and I think that it's important to teach uh, the uh, learners about the emotion words uh, about the concepts, but also about the nonverbal ways of expressing uh, emotions and body language, uh, etc. So I think it's useful, for example, to use uh, authentic material from the television or from uh, newspapers. Um, f just not, not focus just on words, but also on prosody, intonation, maybe use role play to have students perform these uh, and, and it's pretty funny when I did that with my students back in the French classes, we, we would laugh because can, can you now pretend to be a French speaker? And, and, and for, for many that was, the, you know, they, they, all the stereotypes came out and then, but, but then in, in um, exaggerating it, sometimes you get it. Like um, I remember at start when I was just uh, in the UK, you know, imitating a British person, I thought that any British person would, would start laughing and say, oh, you must be faking it, you know. Yeah, but then when I tried, it worked. And I, 
I was so surprised. Yeah. Uh, so to conclude, variation in uh, emotion recognition ability um, is linked to your ability to understand the language, but it's good if you have emotional intelligence uh, as a backup. Uh, you draw on different resources, you combine different strategies, and I would be interested in that also in um, what kind of strategies do people apply? Do people with certain personality characteristics apply different strategies? Does it change as you become more proficient in a language? Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, there is a lot more research to do there. Thank you. Okay, I'm being told we have time for one, maybe two short questions, so if there is anything really urgent. Um, in, the, in the last example that you, in the last experiment that you mentioned, um, the participants were all healthy participants, mentally healthy, I, I guess, yeah. right? Because I was thinking, you know, in terms of, you said, when people have a high linguistic proficiency, they probably would not uh, have trouble um, recognizing emotions. But we all know, I mean, at least from, you know, psychiatric experiments, that, for example, people with autism, right? They're very, you know, they're highly vocal and they have a lot of linguistic proficiency, but they're not able to recognize emotions at all, precisely. So I was wondering, you know, I, I'd be you had considered that. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'd be surprised if they included autistic um, uh, yeah, yeah, participants. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but I, I totally uh, take your point. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also re realized that, that we, we are having trouble getting the paper published because we, we realize that people who work on facial recognition are not interested in linguistic issues. They, they are interested in the debate about universal or cultural specific. And, and, and so we, we sent our paper to these journals, but they, you know, they think it's totally irrelevant. Um, so so we, we, we are kind of, because it's good to say, oh, how nice it is to be interdisciplinary. And, and you talked about humor and, and it's great. But, but, but then it's, it's very often hard to sell it to yeah. people who feel like they own the field. Yeah. And, and you come in as an outsider with concerns that are of no interest to the field, they decide. Yeah. And they reject your paper. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk, Shamarka. It's been really a pleasure to listen to you.